Of God, this why I'm so excited to bring this word to you. So excited. We're reading out of 1 Timothy chapter 4. And let's read the first eight verses. <clears throat> my title of my sermon today is Be Like a Sponge. Be Like a Sponge. Verse 1. Now the Spirit, that's Holy Spirit, expressly says that in latter times some would depart from the faith giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from foods which God created, to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good, and nothing is to be refused if it is received with thanksgiving, for it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. Wow. If you instruct the brethren in these things, Paul to Timothy, you will be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished in the word of faith, the words of faith, and of the good doctrine, which you have carefully followed. But reject profane and old wives' fables and exercise yourself toward godliness. For bodily exercise profits a little, but godliness is prof profitable for all things, having promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. I love that. Let's bow. Father, I thank you for the word today. I'm rejoicing in my soul. I ask, Lord, that as you have shown this word so clearly to me, that you will help me as the speaker today to do the same for every listener. And that your glory and your praise will be done. So now, Lord, speak. Holy Spirit, speak and give us ears to hear and listen. And to follow through with obedience. We ask these things, the Lord, there's so much more you would like to do within this congregation. I pray, Father, you'll have the freedom to do that in each one of us. We ask it in the name of Jesus. And all of God's people said, Amen. 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 All right. Well, I already alluded to the fact that these two letters, 1 Timothy you may be seated, and 2 Timothy, are letters that the Apostle Paul wrote at different times, the second time when he was in prison in Rome. And there's kind of a different feel, a bit of a different feel to each of these letters. But they carry some great words of gravity that the seasoned apostle is trying to convey down to the, his underling, if you want to call him that, his protege. He's trying to say, Timothy, you're young, you're inexperienced, let me give you some advice. Because after all, Timothy's been given a great responsibility, as young as he is. He's been placed over the head of the church there in the city of, of Ephesus. I've been there. It was a very large city of about a million people. And the church was probably the most prosperous church, the fastest growing church in all of Asia Minor. And so here's young Timothy, got this mega church, that he's having to minister to, and he's probably overwhelmed and wondering, how am I going to do this? Paul, bless his heart, sends this out, but not only just to inform Timothy about things he needs to be aware of, things he needs to look out for, that he used to be cautious of, and other practical things within the body of Christ, but also to you and to me here 2,000 years later. 
This book was written uh, right around about 50, somewhere between 50 and 60 A.D., somewhere like 20, 25 years after Christ was crucified and ascended to the Father. And so this was very early in the body of Christ, in our history, for the church. And what's intriguing to me is how quickly... Certainly the church grew and prospered and flourished, but at the same time how quickly Satan was able to infiltrate and cause there to be controversy and heresies and other things in the body of Christ. Just like we have today, except it's very widespread all over the world. Today we have thousands of denominations, we have countless cults, many of them came out of Christian organizations and associations, and so what we're experiencing today as the body of Christ in the world is just on a much more wider global scale than what Timothy was dealing with locally. But it's information that we definitely need. Now, let me explain my title today, which is Be Like a Sponge. Be Like a Sponge. Now, sponge is often a kitchen item that we use to clean up messes, right? And a sponge is just a sponge, it doesn't have a soul. It doesn't have the ability to say yay or nay. It will be used for whatever the user wants to use it for. And a sponge can clean up a spilled water mess. Or when a baby spills its juice or milk. But it can also pick up and absorb toxic things like poisonous and hazardous chemicals and materials in your home that also spill. And so I have to put an addendum on that title, be like a sponge, but only absorb the right things. See, we have a free will. Paul mentioned that they, uh, he and J.R. had attended a Bible, a Baptist church in Chicago called the Free Will Baptist, which is a different segment of the Baptist, very different than, say, the Southern Baptist. It's kind of a different sect, a tear-off of the Baptist church from way back. And that free will, now I could be wrong in this, so I, I'm, I need to be careful, but that free will has to do, I'm sure, in adverse to the Calvinistic view of predestination and of the elect and all that. Some of you know what I'm talking about because you came out of those Calvinist organizations that, you know, believe that some of us have been made for destruction and some of us have been made for eternal life. And that there is no crossing of those borders. Now, I know some of you have been taught that from this high. But when you study the scripture, you find out what all of that doctrine really is about. It's just something that some men came up with four or five hundred years ago. That had not been mentioned in the annals of history prior to that. To speak of. And so these are the ways that churches, that organizations, that well-meaning ministers can get so off base and get away from the Word of God and begin to believe, hear me now, begin to believe the words of men over the words of God. That's what organizations and denominations and many ministers and associations, that's what they're all about. And I could show you that ad nauseum. Historically, regarding the, uh, the, his, the history of religion and so on. And so we're here this morning to soak up, hopefully, 
God's word here, especially in Timothy and other scriptures as well. So what we want to do is soak up the word of God and the Holy Spirit. That's critical. Why would we want that? The scripture given to us plainly in verse 1 of that chapter says giving up because the Spirit expressly says that in the latter times, which we live in, some will depart from the faith. You want to absorb these things like a sponge so you don't depart from the faith. As tens of millions of people just in the last 15, 20 years have done. Why did they depart from the faith? Because they failed to give heed to what the Holy Spirit is saying and instead gave heed to deceiving doctrines and doctrines of demons. Of demons. Wow, is that saying it plain? If the Apostle Paul was anything, he was plain and to the point. You didn't have to wonder, what's Paul thinking? (laughs) He would just tell you what he's thinking. So we don't want to depart from the faith, do we? I mean, that's a big deal. Said in the last days, there are going to be people departing from the faith. God forbid that any of us would be in that crowd. Now, here's what I find as a minister, as a pastor. As I deal with people from day to day regarding their Christian lives is... I sometimes encounter the Christian who I would label, if I may, as the proud Christian. Now, boy, that's poison. That's God deferring. That's, that's God expelling. When we have pride, say, so, well, how does pride manifest? In these people. The proud Christian says, and I've heard many say this, don't worry about me, Pastor. I would never depart or deny God. And when they say that, my mind goes back to Peter, who told Christ the night before, night of, that he denied Christ three times. Say, I will never deny you. I will die with you. But to save his skin, three times he lied and said, I don't know him. And the third time he swore. Just to make the emphasis, I'm not of that group. How many of you know that our language ought to tell which group we're from? (laughs) Do I need to be any plainer about that or did that... Go home. So as I said earlier, Timothy was the overseer of Ephesus. There in the middle of the first century, in the very early years of the Christian church. And they had, back then, the same kind of problems, even then, that we have today. Let me briefly give you some of the things that they were having to deal with that Paul was trying to warn him of. Number one, false prophets. What do you think? Are false prophets in the body of Christ today? (laughs) You'd like to think not. Now I'm talking about in the congregation of the body of Christ. Are false prophets at work? You better believe they are. Many times they're prominently on display prominently on the platform. And so he's warning them that there's going to be false prophets, especially in the latter times, which we live in. Number two, he said there's going to be defections from out of your ranks. And as I was studying this, by the way, uh, a few days ago, I read 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy. It took me, I tried to time it, but I think it was about 25 minutes to read those ten chapters, without rushing. But in 2 Timothy, 
I knew that this was there, but I'd never seen the quantity of it. That there are eight separate people that Paul mentions by name and said, these men defected. These men ran out on me. Some of these men began to speak against me and began to introduce improper and wrong doctrine in the body of Christ. He said, the only one, notice this, here he is in prison in a rank and dank jail cell with sewer running through the floor of it. And he said, the only one that remained with me was Luke, Dr. Luke. He said, all the others, they all forsook me. So he says, in the latter times, there's going to be defection. It hurts greatly. If you've ever had a dear friend just abruptly sever your friendship and leave you standing there with your mouth open. You're wondering what happened. Probably you've all had that. I have. Boy, not too many things cut any deeper than that. Am I right? And Paul is feeling that deeply. And he's naming them Surprisingly, by name. Timothy, if they come around where you are in Ephesus, be aware of these men. You see, do you see the understanding of that? Why you would name them by name? Now, it doesn't mean he doesn't love them anymore. It doesn't mean that he hates them or doesn't forgive them. I don't believe that's the case. He's just sending out a warning to his protege, Timothy. Be careful, because these men are not trustworthy. Have you ever known that? I mean, have you ever considered that? He's also saying that there are going to be many doctrinal disputes. There's going to be false prophets who enter in that introduce doctrines that are not biblical and are not from Christ. Now, interestingly enough, I think probably before he even read, uh, wrote, either of these epistles to Timothy, he gave that warning to the whole leadership of the church in Ephesus. And we can see this over in the book of Acts, chapter 20, verse 28. Acts 20, 28. This is what he is telling. The last time you'll probably see these people, they're grieving because they know that. This is some of his last words to the leadership of Ephesus. He says, Therefore, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you not sparing the flock. Also from among yourselves... So you're going to have wolves from the outside coming in. But he said, even from amongst yourselves, there will be men who will rise up speaking perverse things. Why? My word. To draw away the disciples after themselves. You wonder why there's so many thousands of denominations it's because some man or some woman decided, I would really like to have my own group. And so I'm going to tweak this, and I'm going to say this a little differently, and do this a little different, and take this out of the Bible, and add this to the Bible. I'm going to start my own little group. See what happens. You see how that clearly Paul is warning them in this prophecy? This is what's going to be ha still happening. Still a prominent thing in the body of Christ. And in 1 Timothy 4.16, Paul speaks to that again to Timothy. He said, take heed to yourself and to the doctrine. The doctrine is this, the word of God. Continue in them, for in doing this, you will save both yourself and those who hear you. 
Now you can make up whatever you want, whatever your doctrinal denominational background may be on salvation, but you need to put that aside just for the moment and see clearly what Paul, the apostle, is saying regard to the doctrine and our, the importance of continuing in it, that to do so will save us and those who will listen, follow through and obey. Do you understand the importance of what I'm saying and doing this morning? And lastly, but not leastly, is there will be greedy teachers who are coming in among you to fleece the flock. I mean, we are sheep, right? What do people do with sheep? Eventually, they fleece them. They don't kill them, but they fleece them of what belongs to theirs so that they may be enriched. Said so there's going to be a lot of that going on. How many of you find it hard to believe that that's going on? Yeah. That's why we are so careful about money here. You don't see me touching the money. I don't even know what comes in until once a month I get a report from our accountant. An accountant that does not attend this church. Wonderful man of God named Don Wickstra. God bless him. How many times God has brought his name to me. And he is the one that handles the money of this church and does it in an honest way of integrity to this church. Thank God for him. Amen. And so, um, that's why I'm very careful about it. I don't draw an income from this place. I'm not saying I couldn't. The Bible says very clearly that the the laborer is worthy of his earnings. I very clearly could say to you one morning, you know, I really feel it's time you started paying me. I, I would have every biblical right to do that. But I've never done it. And it doesn't make me a great big person. It's just God just never instituted that in me to do that. And the ministers that get their, make their living from the pulpit, God bless them. My dad is that. My family. We got clothes on our back and food on our table because of the hearts of Christians that were obediently tithed and gave to the church so that my family could live as good as, as, good as they live for the most part. So I'm not against that. I'm just saying we from the very beginning, being God said, I will have a house of prayer that will not be a den of thieves. Now, I'm not saying every church is a den of thieves or every organization. Don't hear me that, on that. I'm just saying it can happen if we're not careful. Greedy teachers fleecing the flock, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 6 through 11, he demonstrates what he's talking about. Stay with me now. I'm going to bring this home here in a minute. 6.6 6 of 1 Timothy. Now, he says, godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and clothing, with these we shall be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and to any many foolish and harmful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. Wow. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil for which some have strayed from the faith. There it is again, strayed from the faith. In their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. But you, O oh man of God, flee these things and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, gentleness. Now, I get criticized. Every pastor gets criticized. You better grow a rhino skin real quick if you're going to be a pastor because you're a target. 
And I'm sure I get criticized. And some of those things are legitimate, probably. But one thing I'm determined, you're never going to be able to criticize for me accurately, is for a love of money. Because it's been my practice for many years to seek the kingdom of God first and his righteousness, knowing all these other things shall be added. That's, that, that's the whole ball of wax for me when it comes to finances. Is this, am I making this clear? There are other things that I hope to never be criticized for. I hope to never be criticized for unrighteousness. Because that's part of that agreement with God that I have. Seeking His kingdom first and His righteousness. Anything less than that is not good enough. Of the things that legitimately can, I can be criticized for, uh, I hope for grace from both you and God. You know, and it takes a while for us to work out those things, right? Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Which I, I practice. So all of these things we're talking about here were external introductions from wolves that were passing through and then integrating themselves into the congregation. Wolves dressed like shepherds or sheep so that they may fleece the flock and introduce heresy and other things in. Now that's the external introductions, but as we will see perhaps in the next message, there are also going to be internal problems which would also arise organically, if you want to say it that way, within the body of Christ. And, and we'll, we'll speak to those things. Uh, I've experienced, hey, I've been here 25 years. I'm in my 25th year. And I've experienced so many of the very things that I just spoke to you about. I'm going to give you three examples. And I'm going to try not to belabor them. Because I'm trying to keep this into a timely format. But I will give you three examples when that happened and, and how God dealt with me. Some time ago, um, and I take full responsibility for this. But I was familiar with, had worked with a couple of ministers that I didn't know greatly, but I, I trusted them. Listen, here's another thing about me. I'll, I'll trust you and I'll believe you until you finally, in your behavior, actions, convince me that what you're saying is not true. I mean, I'm gullible. And I ask God that I not be so gullible. I ask Him all the time. One of the great gifts of the Spirit that I ask Him for, repeatedly, is the gift of discernment. It could save me a lot of trouble. But instead, I defer to what I feel is love, and I give people the benefit of the doubt. And I gave these men the benefit of the doubt. And they asked me if they could use our facility here. And again, I'm taking responsibility for this. I didn't pray enough about it. I just said, yeah, I think that would be fine. And they came in here, and fortunately... Uh, I determined I was going to attend the conference mainly because I just wanted to be a learner myself. I wasn't going to have anything to do with it. wouldn't be asked to pray or oversee anything. Just a participant. And I was okay with that. And I sat there for that weekend conference and in the process... There were some things that bothered me, that disturbed my spirit. One was virtually no prayer. This is a house of prayer. But 
It bothered me. And at one point, I walked up to one of the leaders after seeing a couple of sessions go by without prayer. I said, you think next time, next session, could we maybe start with some prayer? That's the only thing I requested. Oh, yeah, prayer. Yeah, we could probably do that. I said, that'd be great. The other thing that disturbed me, besides the, the no prayer thing, was very little of the Word of God was being presented in this conference that was being presented to Christians. I went, wow, where's the Word of God in all this? Well, I sat through that very patiently and and then toward the last session, next to the last session, I'm sitting right there. And what I'm hearing from this pulpit is so counter to what we should be being taught. It had become all about money. It had come all about being successful and rich. I sat there and something happened to me that I cannot remember having ever happened to me before or since. I began to shake. My hands started shaking. And my arms started shaking. And this aboding feeling came over the top of me. And I felt like if I continued to sit there and say nothing, I would explode. That I had to do something. And so I said, I still have to do this in the right way. So I walked all the way to the back where one of the leaders was and I engaged him back there very quietly. I said, I need to say something. Oh, Oh, okay. We'll make time for that at some point. I said, no, no, you don't understand. I need to say something right now. And I'm shaking. So he and I came back up here and we stood right there. At the person that was speaking, he said to him, he said, Dora would like to say something. I don't know if he said Pastor Doyle or Doyle, whatever term he used for me. And the guy said, oh, yeah, yeah, we'll get to you in a little bit. I said, no. We will get to me right now. I'm going to speak what God is telling me to speak. And some of you were there that morning, that evening. And I told you, I said, you've never seen me like this. And it took me, and, and I spoke what I believe God was giving me to speak. And I told those people that had been hearing this for that whole time, I said, don't believe this, this stuff. I said, don't take this as gospel into your heart. That's because this isn't right. This isn't what God is giving to us as the body of Christ. I said, don't do it. Shaking. It took me quite a while, maybe even until now, to process what happened to me that morning. It has taken that long, I'm not kidding. What I was feeling, the reason I was trembling, is the awe and the fear of God came down on me. That's right, that's right. And basically said to me, what? are you doing Doyle? What has this church been dedicated and sanctified for? To be a house of prayer or to be a den of thieves? Took me that long. Oh, I left that service and I tell you, I just went and I drove and I drove aimlessly around the city. So shook up. There was a godly fear upon me. God, what have 
I've done. Please forgive me and I'll never let it happen again. That weekend was the last time either one of those men had spoken in this church. I love them. If you think I don't, then you don't know me. And I'm not saying they're not saved or they're not legit or anything. I, I believe they both meant well. I really do. But I think someone had twisted the whole thing and got them thinking one thing or the other. The very thing that I said... In that message. Some of you were here. You heard me say this. I said this thing they're talking about is going to fail. And it's going to fail royally. And within months it sunk under its own weight. Destructively. You see it was that was quicksand. Not solid rock. Quicksand. What kind of message do you want me to preach this morning? One that's quicksand that you sink in or one that's the solid rock that you can stand on and be safe from the elements of this world? Another time. This was several years ago. Most of you weren't even here. But there was an evangelist that came here. He had been recommended strong to me by one of the primary elders of our church. And Terry will probably remember some of this and the inner workings of it. And I took the word of that elder that this person was a good, legitimate person and would really bless the church. And so I agreed for them to come to a series of meetings. And uh, there was two things that really stood out about this person. First of all, this widely known minister. First of all, I have never before been bragged up like he bragged me up. Like I was the greatest thing ever. He didn't even know me. And I was suspicious of the whole thing from the beginning. Wait a minute. Why are you trying to build me up, buttercup? You know, I went, oh, maybe that's just personality. He's just an edifier and all that. Oh, okay. And the second thing is every single message he preached five or six times, every single message was the same message. Well, listen. There are certain things that we need to hear over and over, but there are sometimes we need to hear the variety, the whole Word of God. Not the same thing over and over. How many of you would still be coming here in a year if I preached this message Every single Sunday. You'd say, wait a minute, Pastor. There's got to be more than this. Now, maybe just maybe that's God. You know, again, I'm gullible. I'm trying to believe the best. That's just God. Using him to get a point across to it. And it was a good message. At the end of that revival, and I just knew. <laughs> God was telling me as the pastor of this church that it's done. It's over. Move on. And so he came to me and I said, that'll be our last service. He said, what? He said, man, we're just getting started here. We need to keep this thing going. I said, no, that's it. And I said, meet me at such and such place and I'll bring a check for you. Let me tell you how the offerings work at this church. If we have a pastor, an evangelist, someone visiting here, that missionary, we take an offering for, we do that. We've done it dozens and dozens and dozens of times. Let me tell you, you can take this to the bank. That if we tell that person every dime that comes in through this offering is going to be given to you. Unlike many pastors and many churches around the country and world, We don't take a cut of that offering and then give them 30% of it. So if $500 comes in, we give them $500. Usually, and if Diane was in here, she she would assert what I'm saying is true. We usually bump it up. So if $237 comes in, we'll usually bump that to $300 or $400. We'll add money to that. 
to just make sure they really feel appreciated and that we valued their contribution to us. That's how we work here all, to, all the time. I met him off campus. And when I saw the check and the amount that we had taken up for him in five or six services, my mouth dropped open. It was the second largest offering we had ever given any ministry. And the only reason that there is a ministry that we gave more to is because one individual decided that would be the day they would throw a huge amount of money into it for another minister. I mean, it was huge. And I, I'm used to working with money. You know, I'm used to working with millions and millions of dollars. So to, to see this come from this little church, it was like, I was like, wow, I can't wait to give this to him. He's going to be so excited when he sees this. And I handed him the check, and he looks at it, and he stares at it, and he looks up at me, and he goes, is that all? I, and literally, how many times have you seen me speechless? I thought I didn't hear him correctly. I said, what do you mean? He goes, well, let me ask you something. Is this what came in during the revival? I said, every dime of it. He goes, well, let me ask you another question. Did you take out of the church treasury and add to this? I said, no, we didn't. He said, why not? It took me a while to process that, but... I can tell you, even though he called me back multiple times and wanted to come back, I told him, I said, we can't afford you. I think that's what I said. Love to have you back, but we can't afford you. What do you mean? You say, Pastor, why are you telling us this? I'm telling you this so that we can be more alert and not so naive and not so gullible. about what seemingly well-meaning people are really up to. And then I, I, I've got so much more to preach, but I think I'm going to end it on, on this and along with the Scripture. This was a time several years ago when a very well-known person to this area, I invited them to come and speak here, and they came and they, they brought a great message. Really, I mean, I loved it. I told him, I said, man, I love that message. I ate that up. But again, and again, I don't know what the correlel, uh, correlation here is, but every time I invited him back, he preached the same message. The same message. I thought, this guy has been studying the Word of God longer than me, been preaching longer than me, knows more than me, there's not another message in the book? That bothered me. But it was more than that. It was two very subtle things. One of the things was, and this was so subtle that my guess is not one of the people at this church that heard the message even got it. Even heard the perversion of the Scripture of the statement that he was saying. I'm not even going to tell you what it is. Someday I'll share with you, but I, I need to use some wisdom in the meantime. That was one thing, and I let that go. And I, th I just continued to give him the benefit of the doubt, thinking, well, maybe no harm done, no foul, no harm. Until one day, two of my main leaders, my right-hand people, came to me and said, we had a meeting with such and such. And he privately asked us if we would leave your church and come with him because he wanted to start his own church. 
I was flabbergasted. I was blown away like, wait a minute. I promoted this man. I have loved him. I have given him through the church here many nice offerings and, and allowed him to use our building for some of his own meetings, you know, and all of that. And he's doing this behind the scenes. Well, I can tell you, I refuse to have him back after that. You say, do you hate him? Do you have that awe against him? No. I honestly don't. If I saw him on the sidewalk today, I would greet him and embrace him as a brother in the Lord. God knows my heart. But I'm just saying, we've got to be so careful, folks. I have to be more careful. Say, well, what is it about you, Pastor? What does all this say to us? And I only tell you this because I, I don't know what else to do to explain to you and, and experiences along with the word that I've actually seen. But, but let me read that First Timothy. Um, all right, no, let me hold off on that. If I get into that, I've got to get into something altogether new. But I will just con conclude with this. Folks, I just gave you three times, but there are many times, sometimes you didn't even know it was happening that I've never even talked about. Times when wolves came in amongst us. I've had people, I've had witches come in amongst us. I've had wolves that weren't quite, that were much more subtle than that. I've had people come in here with agendas that they were going to enforce their agenda on this church. I've had men walk off the street and garner me and corner me and saying, you're preaching the wrong doctrine and I'm here to show you what the right doctrine is. I mean the audacity that people would do that. So whatever that may be worth to you, I can't say and it's not about me, but it is the responsibility God has placed on me as long as I'm the pastor of this church that one of my jobs is to protect the flock. And whatever means I have to protect the flock, but still do it in the spirit and the love of Christ. I didn't name names today like Paul did. <laughs> Paul named them. I didn't name any names. Because I still, I still want those ministers whom I love and who I would receive. One of them called me uh, just two or three weeks ago. And different things were happening. I was traveling. I didn't get to talk to them. I said, I will call you back. And I did. I left a message and haven't heard back from them. And I don't know why they were calling me. But I assure you, when they do, I will love them. Any one of them. But will I be as quick to say, here's the pulpit again? Probably not so quick. Someone repents. Or it's incumbent upon us to forgive. And I would. But I would still, I'd verify. See what I'm saying? Has this making any sense? Yes. Did you, did you receive this and, and like a sponge? Did you take this in? That when I come to you, listen folks. I think some people just say I'm some yokel, you know, that just happens to be in a position. It's, it's above and beyond that in the spiritual organism of the body of Christ. When I come to you and I've got something to say to you, please at least respectfully receive it and pray about it. Because I'm not doing that for any purpose other than your welfare. That's it. Would you stand with me this morning? I thought surely I'd get through the end of that message today. I told you I was naive. I don't know what we as a congregation are supposed to do with this. God gives it, I receive it, and I give it back out. That's, that's all I know sometimes. 
But God's got a reason that I needed to bring this message today. And, and as Paul did, to throw out some warnings, we're living in a very, very tumultuous, what Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 3, you're going to be in perilous times. And in the coming week or two, I hope to speak to that in a more in a more uh, concise way. Would you bow your heads with me and your eyes? I, I, hope, I hope you love me. I hope that you will uh, receive this in the way it was given to you. I certainly prayed in that fashion. Father, in Jesus' name, Lord, I'm just so excited about what you're doing in me. Thank you, God. No one knows how appreciative I am. And Lord, I can barely convey it to you. But God, what's going on in me, Lord, which is a very good thing. I pray that this would just begin to course like yeast all over this congregation. And that like never before, the people of God here would say, Father, give us more. Give us more. We want more of your Holy Spirit to consume us, Lord. Oh, God. Oh, God. So, Lord, just do that work in our people. They're a wonderful people, as you know. They give me the opportunity to come here and speak. And, God, that alone says a lot for them. Thank you for each one. Blessings be upon them. Father, encourage them to walk in the truth. Encourage them to be people of the Word. If I could just say this last one thing as your eyes remain closed. I recently had a man come to me who was really struggling with some issues. Serious issues. And I asked him and I said, I said, do you read the Word? And he said, no. But I do a lot of other things. I didn't ask him what those other things were. But I thought you've already indicted yourself by saying you are not reading the Word. What are you going to soak up? What are you going to soak up, people of God? If you're not soaking up the Word of God, you're maybe soaking up something that's not going to edify you in the end. The Word of God and the Holy Spirit, we are to soak these things into our being. God, let it be. So, Lord, I pray that for the congregation here. And, Lord, I want everyone here to know this one thing. You spoke it to me yesterday. It's not too late. It's not too late. You say, wasted years, maybe so, but it's not too late. You're going forward, my friend. God's got something awesome for you. If you believe Him, it's going to be good. It's going to be rich. You've got to believe it. So Lord, I do pray that. And Father, Chevelle left this place two Sundays ago. And that day, he made a decision. I'm turning my back on the world. And I'm turning my heart to God. I'd never heard him say that. That night, his life was required of him. So happy, Lord, that He found that place of peace before He went out of this world. Thank You. So Lord, I pray if there be anyone here this morning that is still in that no man's land between where You were and between God's kingdom, I would pray that You would just by faith pray this prayer. Heavenly Father, forgive me of my sin. Come into my heart. Take away my sin. I believe you are the Son of God. And that your blood, your sacrifice, is sufficient to take away all the sins of my life. Forgive me and cleanse me now. I believe you have made me to be a child of God. I'm born again into your kingdom. And I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. If you prayed that prayer in your heart, Consider it done in the work of God.
Now just put your hands up. I'm going to bless you one last time here today. Father, I just pray a pastor's blessing <clears throat> over every, every soul in here that would receive it. I pray that they heard this word and were not distracted by anything else. I pray they'll take it to heart. They'll put it into their daily practice. They'll get into the Word of God every day. They'll pray and allow the Holy Spirit to minister to them daily. And I pray from that, Lord, that they will be enriched in every way, Lord. Spiritually, relationally, emotionally, financially, and in every way, Father. May they be blessed even as their soul prospers. And I ask this in the precious name of Jesus. And all of God's people said, Amen. Love you. Have a great, have a great afternoon. Pastor, we're gone again next week. Oh. Amen.